Hi, welcome to Worship at Westminster. We're really glad you're here. Um, and happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there. I hope you have a beautiful day. Well, for a couple of hours today, the power went out in the Westminster Church building. And I started to think of it, I guess, metaphorically, that honestly, we have had a lot of challenges, everybody has, in the last months and weeks. And, you know, sometimes we feel a little powerless and deflated, but I feel like churches, we're learning it's way more than the building. And that there still is that power of faith and hope and love that is very present in our community. And we see it in things like fish delivery, fish bagging that we're continuing to do, we will do, um, even today, actually, on Sunday. Um, then also, I just saw a spark that was so exciting. We had the high school kids here and in our pavilion just a couple of nights this last week. And we had our own little mon treat because we can't go to the regular mon treat. And we talked about the theme better together. And just to hear the determination and hope and compassion um, in the voices, stories, and conversations of the kids, it's really amazing. And I know that this is a community that we're growing because they have a lot of really amazing people to look up to. So I found that a big inspiration this week and just reminded me again that the church building isn't the church, that we're all the church. And even though we're in some strange circumstances right now, um, we're gonna remain the church and I would think be even stronger at the other end of this. Um, our task force of medical professionals are pretty clear in telling us that we're not ready to go back into the church building yet, but we, having seen that outdoor socially distant event, we're starting to think of things that we can do for the whole congregation. And one thing we wanna do is a movie on the first part of July. So please watch your email I think what we'll have to do is ask people to RSVP so we make sure and have um, enough space between us and so we can stay safe but still have a good time. And this will just be the first of, of many things to come. Ways to engage each other even though it's going to be a little bit different than we're used to. So um, I'm excited about that and look forward to seeing you. I miss you all so much. Well, let's together prepare our hearts and minds for worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it.
morning and happy Father's Day. I want to say happy Father's Day to my dad. I love you, dad. And I want to say happy Father's Day to Lila and Jack's dad, Stephen. I love you, Stephen. Today we're going to celebrate um, Lila and Jack's dad by having a pool party. That's something he likes to do. And I'm going to make all of his favorite foods for us to take over. And then later in the week, we're going to celebrate my dad by going out to dinner on the boat, having a picnic on my brother's boat and celebrating him that way. So instead of gifts, we're just celebrating our dads with the things they like to do, which I think that makes most dads pretty happy. So we're celebrating those dads, but we also all have another dad that we get to celebrate this weekend and every weekend, and that's our Father God. When we say the Lord's Prayer, we start by saying, Our Father who art in heaven, and there are lots of times throughout the Bible that you hear God referred to as our Father, and He loves us and protects us and cares for us just like dads do. So we can't send God a Father's Day card or have a pool party or eat dinner with him, but we can celebrate him in another way, and that's by thanking him and showing him that we love him. So I have a Bible verse, and it's Deuteronomy, I didn't memorize it, it's Deuteronomy 10, 12, and it says, What does your father ask of you but to love God, walk in all of his ways, and serve your Lord, the Lord your God with all your heart and soul? So, you might not be able to give God a hug and say Happy Father's Day, but you can do those things for Him. You can love Him, and you can live the way that He wants us to. All right? So, Happy Father's Day, let's say a prayer. Dear Father God, thank you for our dads, and thank you for being our Father in Heaven. Let us celebrate you every day. Amen. God has promised that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Therefore, let us call upon the Lord confessing our sins. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we come before you in humility to confess our sin. The light that shines through the cross illuminates the many ways that we fail to live as your people. Forgive us for being more quarrelsome than compassionate, more self Sisters and brothers, by the power of God's Holy Spirit, our hearts are renewed and we are free from sins. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Old Testament reading today is from Genesis chapter 21. Listen for the word of the Lord. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, 
whom she had borne to Abraham playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the boy and because of the slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it in, on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. But when the water and the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt.
The gospel reading today is from Matthew chapter 10. Listen for the word of the Lord. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot f fill, kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. After his wife died, my Uncle Ted uh, is actually my grandmother's uncle, but everybody called him Uncle Ted. I called him Uncle Ted. He would come over to her our house every Sunday afternoon and I was initially worried when I was very little because my grandmother said when he was there he wanted to watch his favorite TV show and it was on Sunday evening and that that was my time I had two times Saturday morning was my time cartoons Pink Panther Spider-Man the Jetsons uh, and then Sunday evening the Walt Disney movies Herbie the Love Bug and so forth and I didn't want anything infringing on that but uh, so Uncle Ted would come over and we'd sit and watch Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Every Sunday evening, there's me and Ted, Uncle Ted on the couch, watching Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. And it kind of became our thing, you know, just the two of us. We'd be sitting there. And when Uncle Ted come over, he, he would bring, he'd bring fresh vegetables from his garden. And um, he was just very good to the family and usually have me some kind of little treat or something. Uh, and I just remember him to me as this just very kind and, and, and gracious man. And then later the adults would be talking in the kitchen and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't paying any attention, but uh, Uncle Ted would usually start ranting about something and my grandparents would just listen to him. And the older I got, when I was able to kind of hear what they were saying, I got to the age where I realized that Uncle Ted was a vehemently bitter old racist uh, and the things that he would say I was just just ashamed of and I just I couldn't understand that and I asked my grandmother and and she said and God bless her this isn't an excuse but she said well that's you know that's just the way he was raised kind of um, kind of thing um, I remember sitting at funeral for Uncle Ted. Um, mixed feelings, mixed emotions, I guess. Uh, questions of where did that, where did that hate, where did that, where was it fear? I don't know what it was. Where did, where did that come from? You know, my grandparents were raised in that same milieu. They weren't like that. I just, I don't know. And I was just uncomfortable that that's part of, part of my own family, you know, the things that were said. Uh, I don't have I don't have any answers for all the world's ills, and and uh, certainly the, the 
civil and you know, racial unrest that we find ourselves in. But at the very least, we have to begin, <clears throat> I think, by, by being honest about ourselves and, and, um, and who we are and, and at least be willing to sort of face that, that uncomfortableness, face that, that discomfort. Um, a lot of us just find ourselves troubled by the way we, by the way we treat each other, by what, by what the, the way people treat people in, in, in our families, in our human family, in our religious family. I mean, you read the text of all the great world religions, and they all, including our own, say the same thing. We're siblings separated at birth, and yet we don't, we don't treat each other like long-lost brothers and sisters. And I have those same questions of, of <clears throat> discomfort, I think, when I look at our passages today, particularly this Genesis passage that Mary read uh, about Hagar and Ishmael. <clears throat> Excuse me, I know it's supposed to, I know what the theme is of these, all these narratives, right? It's God's providence. Just when you think God's promises are about to be extinguished, you're holding on by a thread something miraculous happens. And God has carried God's people all the way through the centuries, right? So here's Abraham and Sarah. They can't have a child. And it looks hopeless. So in the meantime, Sarah gives Abraham her servant girl, which they have as a possession, a gift, because Abraham had given his wife Sarah, in order to avoid trouble, to a pharaoh at one point. I mean, this is real, all just sort of real housewives of Egypt kind of stuff, you know. And so Abraham with poor Hagar, they have a child, Ishmael. And then later on, miracle of miracles, Sarah conceives, and they have a, a child. And as this large, blended, dysfunctional family grows together, and one day Sarah sees Ishmael and Isaac playing, and she's overcome with jealousy. And she asks Sarah, or asks Abraham, to send them away. And he does. He takes them right up to the edge of the desert, gives them a container of water and some bread, and just sends them off into the desert. Out in the desert, Hagar cries out to God, as they come to a point where they're famished and about to die, she lays her son down. She cries out to God, and God hears her. And in fact, tells her that, don't worry, your child will live. In fact, his offspring will be a mighty nation, uh, in which we believe eventually the descendants, uh, one was Muhammad. But it's said that then God opens her eyes and she's able to find water to save herself, her son. She's able to find life. And again, I get, I get the larger story of providence here. See how God provided. Uh, and yet you look at those stories and we can't excuse it away by saying, well, that's how things were done in those days. What Abraham did was awful. What Sarah did was, was shameful. Our history of treating people as less than human. Uh, and then who suffers? Ishmael. It's the, it's the children who suffer. And here's Hagar crying out to God in this barren desert. But she's, just not, she's not just a character in a story. She's... She's the, voice of, she's the voice of every woman that has been abused and exploited. She's the voice of those crying out for justice and, and feeling like they're not being heard. She's the voice of all those mothers who are just sending their hopes to heaven for protection from their child that they not you know, be taken by the desert heat or by gang violence or by police misconduct or that just praying for a bowl of rice in a, in a refugee camp. She's that voice of so many mothers who goes where she needs to go, does what she needs to do to provide a better future for her, 
her children. And we need to open our eyes to see the, the, the Hagars of the world. And maybe that's, that's what this story does in its own way. It, it, it reminds us of, of, the, that, of, of the Hagars, the Ishmaels in the world that, that God's care goes to. Because even as she's cast away, right, by Abraham, by Sarah, she's in the desert but she's not outside the reach of God's love and care. And so in a sense, her story is a permanent reminder that we're all created in God's image, that we all deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. And again, maybe that's why, maybe that's why the stories are there. You know, it's, it's not a great part of our family history in, in, in one sense. And, you know, it's a kind of a, like I said, a kind of an Uncle Ted flashback for myself, but uh, maybe those stories are there to show us something ultimately about God working through all of our brokenness and, and, and messiness. You know, Hagar is, the, is let's see, the first woman in the Bible that God speaks to directly, which is kind of interesting in a foreigner an outsider, a seemingly insignificant, powerless, young slave girl is the first one that God speaks to directly. And she is the first one to name God. God has given, is given names, El Shaddai, God of the mountains, Elohim. Uh, but when God sees her, she says, you are... El Roy. By the way, the youngest son on the Jetsons was named El Roy. So see how this ties together? El Roy in Hebrew, which means the God who sees. The God who sees and hears. See, that's what shines through for me for this story. Through these broken families, through this, this, the, through the patriarchy, through the through the misogynism that's there, it is the nature of God which sort of breaks through all of that. This is the God who sees and hears the cries of injustice, who sees and hears the oppressed when people are suffering and hurting. This is the God, according to our own text, of all religions. And this is a God whose provision, whose providing extends to all, even to what Jesus will call the least of these. God sees even the sparrow, Matthew tells us, which actually is an interesting kind of image when you think about it. I'm not sure how, how comforting it is for the sparrow that God, you know, what is the song, God's eye is on the sparrow. You know, the sparrows were sold for protein <laughs> in the marketplaces. Uh, I think the comf comforting part is supposed to be that, you know, I think it, I think you could buy what, two, two sparrows for a penny, two pennies, you got five, so they threw in an extra one, right? Because a single sparrow was insignificant, it was worthless. And so Matthew, I think, is writing to a community of people undergoing persecution. They're struggling with the things that we struggle with in our daily lives, but also struggling, uh, feeling fearful, feeling insignificant, feeling unnoticed, perhaps. Uh, and that kind of fear, that kind of living on edge is psychologically very exhausting. You know, it's, it's why now all, all of us in, in the midst of the, you know, the, 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 the COVID virus, uh, Universally, I hear people talking about just how tired we all are. You're just, you're just exhausted, you know, at some point. It just takes its toll on you. And here's Matthew telling this community, don't, don't live in fear. Of course, there are things to be afraid of. And it's like, it's not don't be afraid of anything, but it's don't be afraid of everything. Because, because of the reality of God and that we belong to God. When Mary read the scripture, uh, the language in Matthew's gospel, I, 
I'd asked her at one point to maybe use the word servant instead of slave, because even in this gospel, when you, when you know Matthew says a slave is not beyond their master, it's a different context. But those words are just so they carry so much burden and so much baggage that it's hard for us even to hear hear the message that Matthew would be conveying. Uh, and again, that's something we have to acknowledge about our own, our own selves, our own nation and its, and its, and its history and confront that and be, and be open about that. And I think we know, or at least I hope we know what Matthew's saying is that <clears throat> what, if you follow Christ, what happened to Christ could happen to you. And, and was happening to them. When you, when you speak truth to power, when you challenge the status quo, you will face opposition. And that being sometimes, according to Jesus, from your own family, you know. And, and we know cases of, of, you know, people whose allegiance to Christ in various cultures may have caused some familial kind of, of, of shunning or whatever. And, hey, we've all lost Facebook friends over, <laughs> you know, our commitment to different ideas and values, right? Um, but Matthew's saying we can't, we, we can't live in fear of everything. Beca and because God's truth will shine through. Um, and when Jesus says, I come to bring the sword, again, it's a different kind of image, but it's not the sword of violence, it's the sword of truth that God's truth, that God's justice will prevail, will shine through, and we hold on to that. And that's what gives me hope, I think, that a sense of, <clears throat> a sense of good news in the midst of everything, uh, that to anyone that feels insignificant uh, or is made to feel that way, this is the God who, who sees and hears, the God who values human worth, who values everything. I find my hope, I don't understand it quite fully, but I find my hope when Jesus talks about, you know, anyone who, you try to find your life, you lose it, but if you lose your life for the sake of the kingdom that you, that you find it, and there's an answer in there somewhere that this, that this God, this God that sees and hears, <clears throat> that when we that when our life embodies that God who, who sees and hears these cries for justice, who knows our fears, that, <clears throat> that this is a God who also challenges us to open our eyes to, about ourselves, but to the, to the Ishmaels and Hagars out there, to the, all the other sparrows out there, that that's where we find life. And actually I find hope in the, in the old story after Abraham, <clears throat> excuse me, after Abraham cast them away, uh, we don't know exactly what happened to Ishmael and to Hagar, but it says a few chapters later that years later when Abraham dies, that his two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, are there to bury their father. And it's said as a <clears throat> matter-of-fact way, so, you know, who knows what went on, but it at least suggests that reconciliation, that redemption, that forgiveness, both our need of it and our giving it to others, that, that these are not just words, but it's that place where we, where we find God and where God finds us and where we find, where we find life. Hallelujah and amen. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people, to live as one community. But we rebel against God. We hide from our Creator. Ignoring God's commandments, we violate the image of God in others and ourselves. 
please join me in prayer. Loving God, hear us now as we pray. You promise us there is no place we can go where you will not be with us. No prayers we can offer you will not hear. No random thoughts you will not understand. No groans or pleas in which you will not join us. And no rejoicing in which you do not also delight. We are grateful that we walk into each day with that promise and hope. There are those on our hearts who need our church and our community of faith. Hearts are breaking, bodies are failing, minds are confused, families are torn apart. Come to us with your healing power. As we draw near to you, we also draw near to our brothers and sisters around the world. We remember scenes of violence, see places of fear, and encounter people shouting at each other over race, religion, politics, and power. But you breathe your Holy Spirit into the emptiness and confusion of our lives. You give us shape and purpose. Use us to bring good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, bring sight to the blind, and set free the oppressed. Come now and fill us with peace and restlessness that we may respond to your call to justice in imaginative ways. Give us calm and enthusiasm as we do your work in the world. Lift up our hearts to rejoice in the possibilities of each day. May all that we do and say reflect your love and tenderness. Send us out today with joy and hope. Help us to live and proclaim our faith and find the strength to go on, trusting in your Son who lived among us, died and was risen, and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace from this day forward and forevermore. Amen.